What I'm going to, to share with you today is something that God shared with me when I was in the bathtub one time. And the reason I was in the bath, bathtub is, is sort of my sanctuary. When I get to the point where I need to shut out the world and think or, or ponder a question, I go fill a tub full of hot water and sit in there until either I get a conclusion or, <laughs> or I can't hardly crawl out. And at this particular occasion that, that inspired what I'm going to share with you, which I call Lesson from a Trout Stream, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you've ever seen a trout, I think you'll get the general application. But I was sitting in there and, and don't remember the specifics of what my problem was, but I do remember this much. It was a situation where I realized that I was going around the same mountain another time. I, I think that's probably something that most of us, if we're honest, would say, yeah, we've had those experiences where it's like, haven't I been here before? Have my, you know, why, you know, the why am I back here again? Anybody? Anybody out there? Okay. Several honest people. But anyway, the, the, the question was, God, what, why is this still happening? And, you know, what am I going to do? And while I'm sitting there, just in a, a flash of thought, into my, my consciousness came uh, a, a quick trip through the fundamentals of my long-lasting pursuit of brown trout with a fly rod. And uh, I realized that what I was seeing was, was answering my why am I going around the mountain again question. And it, you know, I believe when, when God does speak to you, He can say more in a split second than you can grasp sometimes in a lifetime. But I realized that what He was showing me a, was really profound and I needed to make a record of it. So I jumped out of the bathtub and wrote down all I could. And uh, the other thing that I realized, which I think is really fascinating, is that, that God does not want to, to play games about answering questions. Uh, I think He will speak to men and women in uh, whatever scenario that they will understand. You don't have to be a trout fisherman to get this message. Could be a number of ways, but anyway, it, it was one that, that certainly uh, answered the question I had, whatever it was, and it still does. Occasionally something will come up and I reflect on that and go, oh yeah, there it is again. So, as you can see, uh, I didn't waste any money on art school, but I will from time to time offer an illustration to, to show a point. And what, what you see here, you know, I don't want to be discriminatory on other fish, so other than trout. So this is kind of, think of this as a hybrid, sort of half carp, half tarpon or something like that. But anyway, what, what we have here is, is, is point one, which is, let's say you're a trout fisherman or you're a wannabe trout fisherman, and the question, well, what do I need to know? Well, if you're like me and you are fascinated and intrigued and allured to moving water, you know, I mean, I'll fish a lake if that's all there is, but I love streams, okay? I know what to do with a stream. A lake is like, just kind of like, it's just there, but when the water's moving, I can work with it. Well, anyway, this represents, a, we'll say this is a trout, and he's in the stream, and the first thing you want to know is what's he doing? Well, He's facing the current. First thing you gotta know is which way is the trout pointed? Well, he has no choice. He either has to face the current in order to breathe because the flow of oxygen pulled out of the water in his gills, so he's always looking upstream. So why is that important? Well, from a fisherman's point of view, because if I want to approach him without being seen, I'm gonna get behind him. So guess what? If you see a piece of water and you think, okay, this is a likely looking spot, don't ever approach it from up here because he's going to see you, you know, feel you thundering around on the bank and he'd be gone. But if he turned around, just, just so you understand the, the dynamics of this, if he turned around in that current, the only way he could survive would be to swim downstream faster than the current. And you can imagine a little bit of that, you'd be happy to face the current again. You know, wear you out. My problem was, God showed me in a flash of just this fish facing the current. I realized that the nature of my problem was that I was swimming downstream. Rather than trust that what I need, if I just face the current, which represents in this case faith, I'd be taken care of. But I had things in my past that still had a grip on me, and so I couldn't 
I couldn't look ahead without bargaining with the past, okay? And so what, what I call this is a downstream lifestyle. How many of you know that you can't change anything in the past? It is what it is. And God has provided through his sonship, as explained over and over and over in the gospel, that we can face the current and expect everything we require from him. Going down and, and like I was doing, I was trying to bargain my future with, well, but this has always happened, you know, back then. And, and so I spent a lot of my miserable time in a downstream lifestyle. When I finally figured out that I got to face the current and I could trust that current, then everything changed. So all that is to say in the, in the first portion of this thing is that if, you, if you're trapped in a downstream lifestyle, you will suffocate eventually. And uh, this I can promise you, God can be trusted. You can afford to face the current. All that has happened from, for us from the hand of God has erased from here back in his perspective. And I'd say we can trust his perspective. The yeah buts get you in trouble because it's always downstream. Pretty simple, right? Okay. So much for a downstream lifestyle. Okay. We're looking down from a bird's eye view down in a stream. All right. And we've got our, we're looking down on this fish. He's here, little gills. I bought you that happy little fish. You can tell by he's been gaining weight, so things have been good for him. Current's coming this way. And the, the thing that I like about brown trout in, in streams, and especially intimate little streams, is that they are habitual creatures. <clears throat> and if something doesn't alter their habitat, generations of fish will inhabit the same spot because they're very strategic. And, the, and these brown trout understand that there is a place in that current where the hydraulics of the water will bring what they need to them. Now I'm speaking in terms of, of nutrient, all right, of, of groceries. And so these trout will seek out what I call a feeding lane. And they will park in that feeding lane and it doesn't matter what else is going on around them. They are so convinced and just, they'll stay right there. And uh, so let's just assume for a moment that uh, we are in that like early June type magic type of thing when all these aquatic insects, or at least a great deal of them, start to transform into flying insects, which bring them to the surface. And we have the opportunity for what we fly fishermen refer to as dry fly fishing means that the fish come up and taking things off the surface, okay? And so here's what you'll have. Let's just say that we have some debris, maybe a tree or some boulders there, something over here that forces the basic essence of that current right in through here. Well, the trout understands that he can sit back there where all this is funneling to him and he doesn't have to work, doesn't have to run around, just stay put and dinner will be served. Pretty good deal, right? Well, I have to say that the trout does this automatically. He doesn't require training. He just shows up and does it. This is kind of like the bird dog where he just does what he's designed to do and it works out. And in this case, the trout has got quite a bit going over me in some cases, especially in, in some of my decision-making matters. Now what happens that's interesting about this, let's just say that these little bugs are coming to the surface and they're floating downstream and this trout, it's, it's so neat. Like what I like to do is I like to go up and I, you know, I know the water I fish and I'll watch this spot and I'll sit there and wait. And if I see that little black nose come up and those little slurping nose, they come up and go like that. And then the head goes back down. So it's this little motion, here comes the current. Fish comes up, grabs that fly very gently, not, not tiger shark style, just sips it rolls back down and you see his dorsal fin break the current as he goes down and levels off again. And the last thing you see is his tail. Well, when you see the dorsal fin about this, break the water about this far behind the nose, and then the tail break the water, but it kind of chokes you up. You know, the longer those are apart, you kind of get, <gasps> and so 
I know I'll watch him rise three times, wait till he, he feeds three times, and then I know he's in his feeding lane. This is where he wants to be. Now I can engage. So what I do is I'm going to either from the back behind him, a spot like here, for example, or back here, or maybe even in the stream if necessary. Other opportunities, but I'm going to cast the fly up here above him without crossing him with the line so that he doesn't see it. And of course that long leader, 9, 10, 12 feet, whatever it needs to be is the blind spot because it's monofilament. I'm going to drop that fly right here and let it drift in the current right smack into him. If I do that, there's a good chance if I don't mess up the cast that he'll take that. And this, this is so interesting because this fish is so satisfied that in this spot, he's going to get everything that he wants, that the same insect that he's eating when it's right on his nose may come by over here or by over here, sometimes only inches away, and he won't even move over to get it. Can you imagine that? Listen. If I'd learned that when I was young, there's a whole bunch of things in life I wouldn't have run out and grabbed. All, what I'm saying here is the fish does it automatically. Man's got to think this through. And the issue is how many of us have thought all that glitters must be gold? If you buy that, I've got a bridge I want to sell you. And the fact of the matter is, here's what would happen if I was that trout. Something might go against the bank over here if it looked good like that's what I need. Man, I'd break ranks, run over there and grab that sucker, run back over here, run back here, there, everywhere, dashing around, grabbing everything that looks like it's something I need to hold on to until it whips me. It will wear you out. And I'm looking at that trout. I'll tell you how specific it is. I have gotten behind a big old trout and put the fly above him but it came down almost to the point where it would slide along his gill plate, only that far from dead center, and he wouldn't even move that far to get it. But Lord, if I had the, the faith that that fish is designed to have. And not only that, but I have put the artificial, I tie an artificial fly that represents what's hatching and what he's eating, and I'd put it right on his nose come down there and he would take it while ignoring the actual genuine article two inches to one side. How specific that feeding lane is. And so I'm here to tell you that there's a lesson in that. So let's talk feeding lanes as in people talk. I want you to think about, you know, men, men have this one problem that they grapple with, and that is that you're the provider. You know, you're the guy that's got to make things happen. And so quite often men <clears throat> have an analytical mind that says, you know, let's run the numbers, see how this works. Well, that's fine, except for one little problem, and that is in our world there is there's something that you can't calculate in running numbers, and that is, you know, hey, what's the Spirit saying in this deal? which I spent a lot of my years ignoring. And for example, I'm a writer, spent 25 years as a hunting magazine editor and writer of, uh, you know, hunting and fishing subjects. And um, way back in the day, before Buckmasters existed, who became my employer for 24 years, I was writing for a number of different magazines in America and North American Whitetail, which existed all the way back then, uh, called me and said, hey, we think there's a new world record been taken over in Saskatchewan. Would you go over and get us the story? Said, yes, sir. Will I ever? I mean, that's on a silver platter, right? If that's not in my feeding lane, what is? Right? Would you agree with that? If you were a writer in the next province over, the magazine called you, guaranteed you a, a wage for doing it. Hey, that's what I do. Well, I was also starting to grow, I was a young Christian, and just starting to realize that there was this thing called the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that could communicate with you about things. But I thought that it communicated primarily on spiritual matters, as if everything wasn't a spiritual matter. 
So I listen for it in certain places. Do you know <clears throat> that a man's hearing increases, I am convinced, in proportion with his degree of desperation? You ever notice that, how much better you hear when you're in a panic? All right, so I grab a buddy and we go off across the, you know, I mean, snow up to our ears and driving off and out there. And, and he goes to sleep and I'm driving through the dark and somewhere around the, the border with Saskatchewan and Alberta. And I hear in my understanding two words that just kind of popped into my consciousness and I had no idea what it meant. I just heard, don't go. I don't know if, if I've ever heard an audible word of God, but it seemed that as close as I'm ever going to get. Because it just jolted me so that I looked over at my buddy. I thought, what do you mean? And he's asleep. And I thought, what was that? Well, here's what happened. In reality, that was God trying to save me a long trip for nothing. And I had no idea what it meant. So I went on, got over there, walked in to see the this monster deer that was going to be a world record and the guy in, in the hyper anticipation of the fact that now he's going to be renowned for having shot the biggest deer in the world. And I looked at that deer and instantly knew there had been a mistake. There had been a big mistake. And somebody had calculated something twice because it wasn't even close. And so my, my friend who's sort of a burden bearing sort, you know, he's ready to fall to his knees and and uh, he just crushed for, for me. But it, when I looked at that, I heard, don't go. And the neat part was I recognized I could have turned around right then and gone home and saved myself what I didn't realize was going to be a futile thing. Okay. That thing looked like it was coming into my feeding lane. But in this world of checks and balances that I had not yet discovered, I found out the hard way that wasn't necessarily so. And so a few of these things happened to me like that, and I began to recognize a pattern forming, and it went like this. Um, I was self-employed, and it seemed like my pattern was that I had some sort of an entrepreneurial ability. And so if I saw something that I thought was in my feeding lane, I'd go for it, and... Um, and, and that worked for a while, but then, as a married man, there were occasions when I saw something that was solid gold, and my wife would, would have a hesitation about it, let's say. And I would always ignore her, because my thing is, show, calculate that for me. Where are you coming from? You got a feeling, I can run the numbers. So I discounted that sense that she had about it. And I started to notice the pattern was that every time she had a bad feeling about it, it went in the toilet. Any of you guys honest enough to? Amen. There we go. There you go. Well, anyway, so what happened was uh, some guys came to see me, and I had a, had a background in, in music and television way, way, way back. And... Uh, and, and I was involved as, a, as an outfitter in Alberta as well as a writer. And they came to me because they knew I had some experience with television and wanted to do a hunting video back when they just became available. I mean, we were among the first. And so uh, they wanted me to produce this thing and kind of guide them through it. And they would cut me in on the, on the company that was producing it. And so here's how I dealt with the, with the issue of doing what I wanted to, even though there was a check. I knew that there was some question about the character of these guys. Not that I knew that they were bad people, but I didn't know them that well and I wasn't sure. And um, they asked me to be a part of the company. Well, something in me said, don't be unequally yoked. So I dodged that one and said, okay, I won't be unequally yoked. I won't be a partner. I'll just do it on a on a percentage of sales basis. That clears me. And my wife says, you know that old story, honey, I know that you can do this. I know it's right down the middle of what you can do, but I have a bad feeling about it. Well, I could run the numbers. She had a bad feeling. I did it, all right? We produced the video. It was the biggest selling video of its day by far and still is in terms of the numbers it sold. And when, when the company owed me about $20,000 in royalty, they went underground and emerged as a new company to whom I was not contracted. I never made a penny. 
ooh. Then I saw the pattern. I said, okay, honey, every time you have a bad feeling about something, I get clobbered, so I get it. So now if I'm gonna make a decision about anything important in our life, uh, we will either agree or disagree, and based on that, uh, we will or I won't do something, all right? So I said, all right, before God and everybody, this way it's gonna be, Lord, I'm gonna listen I'm gonna to learn to, to appreciate that which I cannot calculate and try to avoid calamity. Shortly thereafter, after I, after I had said this and, and I meant it, a friend of mine from British Columbia, also an outfitter, called me up and told me that he had a problem that he's got two grizzly hunters coming in from the US and his guide that was supposed to guide them got desperately ill and couldn't come was I do anything and could I come and guide these two grizzly hunters for him or at least one of them? Well, hey, what could be more fun than chasing grizzlies? You know, I was in the center of my feeding lane and I, before I could think, I, I was agreed and ready to go and hot dog. And then my little wife said, Russell, I know that would be really something you'd like to do and I'm not going to try to stop you, but I just have a bad feeling about it. I thought, oh no. <laughs> it may be a bad feeling about doing a, a video hunting deer, but she's got a bad feeling about me going to play with grizzlies. And I could envision suddenly myself appearing in little piles of bear scat all over the upper <laughs> Blackwater region of British Columbia. And I realized I just violated what I just promised not to do anymore. So. For once, common sense over, overcame me, and I called my friend up and I said, buddy, I said, I don't know if you're gonna understand this or not, but I, I have to back out. I said, I, I, I just can't do it. I said, and I told him this much. I said, I, I promised God and my wife that I would not make any major decisions in, in what I do with me or them unless we are in agreement and Charlene has a bad feeling about this, I'm not trying to dump on her, but I'm learning that the bad feeling means something, so please accept my apologies, I have to back out. I said, well, okay, I didn't get the, the, the idea that he fully understood, but he accepted. And so there you stand, not knowing why you've done just what you've done. And that's a weird place to be until you get used to it. Well, the next day, the guy calls me up and he said, I thought you'd like to know. I can tell you why your wife has a bad feeling. I said, really? Yeah. He said, the government just canceled all the grizzly tags in this area. So what does that mean? That means that had I not listened to Charlene, and by the way, if you're a married man, nobody on planet Earth got your back like your wife does. And if there's no trust in that, then you can make some pretty brutal mistakes. So I would have driven all the way over the spine of the Rockies to a dead end road of 150 miles of gravel to a little lake to get in a float plane to take me back into the interior of the upper Blackwater of British Columbia only to find out that I was there for no reason and that I just wasted time and money getting someplace for which there was no reward. Well, I was grateful because man, I got to see in one day that I could trust. God was gracious that way. And so, so life goes. And since then I have stayed with that policy and it has helped me immensely as it can help you too. But all I'm saying is that God gives checks and balances. He cares that much about us. He cared enough to save me two days of driving and a bunch of gas money to go somewhere for nothing. And so I listen to that. And so if it's in my feeding lane and I think it's in my feeding lane, we have a little talk. You say, well, what if I'm not married? Well, you, God's not eliminating you from his safety net because you got, you got several ways to check and balance if you're not too proud to ask. There's this thing called scripture, a thing called spirit, and a thing called saints. And it, it's, it's a pretty good idea, even if you are married, sometimes to sit down with some people. I've had this happen where I'd sit down with some, some people I trusted in the church and said, this is what I'm thinking. Does this make sense to you? And I value their judgment. So 
you know, we could save ourselves a lot of heartache. And uh, when something's coming down the middle of that feeding lane that looks good, check it out. God cares enough about you to tell you if it's what you need or what it, if it's not what you need. That makes sense? So, we've got the uh, face the current. We've got the feeding lane. I understood those two real good. The third one took me, the, it was the hardest one to learn. Let's say that this is the, the top of the stream and we got a kind of a little deep hole down in here and then get shallow again. Well, the water level may be up here all summer, but when it starts to freeze in the high country, the water flow stops, the ice or the, the water level drops down and then it freezes. Okay, so here we got, let's say, three or four feet of ice up here. And uh, during the rest of the year, these fish will be spread out all over the, all over the stream. But when the, when the water gets real low in these areas, they got to find a hole to get in. And so what you end up is a whole bunch of fish down here in this hole with uh, the ice above them. And they're just down there and waiting it out. And you know what they do down there all winter? Nothing. How'd you like to spend all winter in a hole doing nothing? That's the most terrifying thing that could happen to a man. So I saw, the, I saw myself as one of these fish just suspended down there doing nothing, running around banging my head on that ice, trying to do something. Anybody ever feel like we just got to do something? <laughs> Even Cole knows. How are you, Cole? <laughs> He's already got it. That comes with men. You got to do something, man. Men are doers, right? And so when it comes time to rest, that's sometimes the hardest thing for us. The word R-E-S-T, great big word in all the gospel is pointing to this state of being called rest. I'm talking about resting in your soul, resting in your spirit, resting. For what reason would we rest? Because we have no longer any reason to apply ourselves to work to gain anything in the eyes of the Father. He did the work. You understand what I'm saying? It's a hard concept for men. And uh, what is it? Isaiah 64 puts it a neat way. He says that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no one has perceived of a God like this who works on behalf of those who wait for him. The waiting represents faith. The belief that I do not have to make it happen and that God can be trusted. Interesting thing about the dynamics. Uh, let's just compare for a moment. Interesting little fact. You guys know what makes a plane, airplane fly? Okay, let's take the wing design here. All right, say so this is the, the perspective of the design of a wing on an aircraft. And the faster the wind goes up over this design, what it creates is lift, right? And so the faster it goes, the more lift you got, and thus you have flight. Do you know, this, this cracks me up. If you put two airplane wings back to back, you'd have the shape of a fish. So, what about fast water? You know, people get this idea like, woo, I'm not going in there, man, that got a lot of current. Do you know that a fish can sit facing the fastest water going because <clears throat> equal pressure on both sides holds him in place? And I believe that if he, God cares enough about a fish to enable him to stay in turbulent water without working at it, we probably can too. It's a, an interesting concept. And I've sat there on a bridge and looked down in this, you know, boiling fast water and see a fish and <clears throat> he's just sitting there doing this or relaxing. 
I got to believe that that's the way we're designed. You don't have to fear the fast water. You just got to face the current and realize that everything we're learning as we walk through this life, for those of us who are, are trying to comprehend the magnitude of the gospel, <clears throat> is it's not something that we learn so we pass a test at the end. The, the issue is that the gospel is not something we learn, it's something we live. I'm one degree south of 70 years old, and every day I learn something else about that. Oh, that's not an interesting fact. That becomes life, living the reality of it. That's the great, the great excitement, the great challenge. And so I encourage you guys in this way, uh, as you enter into God's rest, you can, you can deal with fast water, you can deal with decisions, you can deal with everything that man has to deal with. And God will be there for you, with you, through it, the whole business. So three things you can take home from this. One is you've got to face the current. Stay in your feeding lane, and it's okay to rest. And that is my lesson from Trout Stream. Thank you kindly for your attention. Thank you.